So it's, it's really great to be here, and I want to thank my friend and uh, board member, Linda Griego, for inviting me here and asking me to come here. So it's a great honor to appear before all of you. Uh, as you heard, I'm in the television business. I've been in the television business most of my adult life. Uh, as Terry said, I started as an actor. And fortunately, I was a very mediocre actor. So early on, I realized my future was better off on the other side of the camera, and it worked out OK for me. Um, my job today is best described as changing the tires of your car while going 80 miles an hour. That's what the television business is like today. Um, as Terry said, we're really proud that for 11 of the last 12 years, we've been the number one network in America, and we have uh, a great content in sports, in news, in entertainment. We have a lot of hit shows. But the world is changing so rapidly for us right in front of our very eyes. Um, today, 75% of our audience watches our shows in their time periods. They'll watch NCIS Tuesday night at 8 o'clock. They'll watch The Big Bang Theory Thursday night at 8 o'clock. And 75% and of the the audience is watching it that way. However, that number is getting smaller and smaller every year. It may not surprise you, but that's also, that audience is also getting older and older and older. Now, a lot of you are involved with USC. I happen to be on the board of the film and television school, so, uh, you know, and my wife's an SC grad from Annenberg, so. But walk on a college campus today. How many television sets do you see? Not too many. There may be a big screen in a dorm somewhere to watch the football game, hopefully on CBS on, on a Sunday afternoon. But the way people are receiving content today is changing so rapidly. And it's our job to do two things. One, to continue to do the greatest content in the world. Um, I'm proud that under me is CBS, as well as Showtime, as well as the CW, as well as many syndicated programs that you may have heard of, like Entertainment Tonight and Dr. Phil and Judge Judy. So we have, we run the gamut from The Price is Right to The Good Wife to Homeland across the board. My job now is very different than my job has ever been. Because not only do I have to produce this great content, I have to find the audience who's going to watch it, and I have to get it to the people where they want to watch that content. So when I say it's changing the, the, the tires of your car at 80 miles an hour, that means I'm chasing after an elusive audience. And frankly, I often get asked when I do an interview or an analyst call, what's the world going to look like five years from now? And the answer I always give them is, look back five years. There was no Netflix. There was no Amazon. There was no Hulu. There was no CBS.com. The world that we're living in today is so vastly different than it has ever been before that every day we are faced with new challenges. So our challenge is to produce this content and get paid for it in as many ways as we can. So the reason I love my job is I get to be a creative guy. I also get to be a business guy. I love entertainment. I love news. I love sports. So I consider, to quote Lou Gehrig, myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. I really do. I love what I do. But right now, we have a couple of thousand people in San Francisco who work for CBSI, the CBS Interactive Group. And most of them are in their late 20s, early 30s, and they are throwing new things at me every single day of the week. This is the latest idea. This is the latest thing you're going to do. This is the next thing for us at CBS. So we are a public company. We are a traditional company. But at the same time, we have to look forward. So recently, we announced a couple of things that we are doing that changes the face of our world. We are putting our content online. It's called CBS All Access. And we just announced it literally three weeks ago. 
So you're all part of our new experiment. So for $5.99 a month, you can get the live feed of CBS. You can also get every episode of every show that's currently on the air this season, last season. Plus, you can get all of our library content. So that means you could watch your favorite episode of I Love Lucy or Star Trek or MASH or Cheers or anything like that. This is a brand new idea. This means you can get CBS anywhere you want it, wherever you want it, and the main significance of this is it's mobile. So when I talk about the kids on the college campus who aren't watching television, how are they getting our content? On their iPads, on their computers, and this makes it available to them in that way. We also changed our world in the world of news. We announced also very recently something called CBSN. So CBS News, as all of you know, is a vastly popular news organization that has bureaus throughout the world. Terry McCarthy is a former member, former correspondent internationally for CBS News. Um, we produce hours and hours and hours of news, and all we have is a 6.30 show with Scott Pelley and the morning news show with Charlie Rose and Nora O'Donnell and Gail King. So we have a ton of content that never makes it on the air. Once again, we don't have a cable news channel. We don't have a CNN or a Fox News. So we have all this content, so we said, all right, let's leap ahead. So CBSN, we call it our cable bypass news channel. <laughs> that means you can go online 24 seven and get what you would get on CNN with live correspondence, et cetera. The great news for us, once again, it's premium CBS news content at a rather minimal price because we're already spending that money to keeping the news division alive. So the world that we're living in is changing rapidly every single day. As I said, you look back five years ago, we were getting paid for our content in a few ways. We'd put shows on the air, we'd get paid for advertising, and then maybe eventually we'd sell a show into syndication and get paid that way. The world has changed so drastically that we are now getting paid in dozens and dozens of different ways. And our main goal, our main goal and how we get that $15 billion of revenue is to figure out how we maximize the value of that content. Obviously, advertising remains very important to us. As the number one television network, we get north of $4 billion a year in television advertising on the CBS television network. But these other ancillary means of getting paid become very, very important for us in our future. The largest growing area for us is the international marketplace. Let me explain why. Currently, CBS shows, and take anyone, take NCIS, it's currently sold in 220 markets throughout the world. It is terrific. The amount of revenue we get keeps rising. And let me explain why. Number one, our traditional partners, and that is Germany, France, the UK, Canada, Australia. They were there for us 25 years ago. But what's happened there is they have done exactly what happened in the United States. They have added cable networks, They've also added the Netflix of the world and the Amazons of the world. So in those markets, which are our major markets, once again, there's much more competition for our shows. And the great news about our shows is we keep selling them over and over and over again. They're called cycles. So right now, this year alone, the CBS Corporation will make $15 million from I Love Lucy. A show that was last produced in 1957. And what I often tell people is, 50 years from now, somebody else is going to be selling CSI and talking about me. Who is that guy that put on CSI just like I'm talking about I Love Lucy today? And the great news about our content, it is evergreen. 
The other way that the international marketplace is expanding, obviously, is into new territories. Latin America suddenly is exploding for us. Eastern Europe is beginning to become a very, very big marketplace. And finally, the Far East. So a minute about China. As you know, China is rather restrictive. They don't buy a lot of our content. You know, there's something wrong with it somehow or somewhere, and it is very difficult. Um, there are inroads being made by the movie companies and the television companies, and recently the, the major studios, some of them, made deals with China whereby they will release a film in China, and they will get 25% of the revenue. It may seem small, but in the Chinese marketplace, it can be a lot of money. The problem facing us in China is piracy. So we know for a fact the Big Bang Theory is huge in China. The only problem is we don't get paid a penny for it, nor does Warner Brothers, who produces the show for us. So once again, as we look down the future, you know, where it's going to grow, that is an area of growth for us. Um, the world of advertising is also changing drastically. Somebody came up to me and says, are you going to talk about Nielsen and about how bad they are, that good shows are being canceled all the time? My answer when anybody criticizes Nielsen is, when you're in first place, you don't question the referee. <laughs> I'll leave that to my competitors who sound like sore losers when they're complaining about Nielsen. The good news about Nielsen and I will talk positively about them, and not just because we're in first place, is the fact that they are now counting more and more people. They are able to go online. They are able to check your DVR. They are able to see people, what they're watching at any time of the day or night. And as long as they're being counted, we are being paid for it. Once again, it's not a perfect science. But the world that we're in is expanding, and we need Nielsen to be there to count those viewers for us, you know? Let me talk to you a minute about demographics, which is a sore point for us, and looking around this crowd, and I'm part of you. Um, a number of years ago, one of my competitors was doing very badly, so they suddenly decided, let's change it. Let's change the scoring system to something called 18 to 49. That's the only demographic that means anything. That's the only demographic that people should be paid for. Now, CBS actually skews older. We are an older skewing network. And it's been one of my pet peeves that an advertiser would consider an 18-year-old having more disposable income than a 50-year-old. You know, one of my competitors once again got on stage, you know, when they were making their advertiser presentation, and they literally said the following, we are number one in 18 to 25-year-old upscale viewers. I said, the only 18 to 25-year-old upscale people I know are my children. <laughs> and before they buy a car, they're coming through me and I'm making the decision and I'm north of 50 years old. So um, the, the good news about what is happening online is the measurements are becoming more exact. Advertising is getting more targeted. We have a show on Sunday night called 60 Minutes, which is now in its 47th year. The average age of the 60-minute viewer is 63 years old. Guess what? We still make a lot of money from 60 Minutes. The audience is older, but guess what? The pharmaceutical companies love us. <laughs> <laughs> so we hit that target demographic, you know? And that continues on Sunday night with Madam Secretary and the Good Wife, we like to call it our smarter three hours of television, which we think is, is terrific. It obviously skews older. It's not as cool as Gotham is on Fox, but we like our programming just fine. <laughs> so once again, I want to open it up to, to your questions. Um, we're living in unbelievably interesting times. You know, my world is changing every single day. Um, fortunately, I, as I said, I have a bunch of young guys who are coming in 
throwing ideas at me, how do we best maximize what we do? But at the end of the day, and it's funny, because today, just today, for you USC people, there was, a, there was a board meeting of the film and television group, and there's some pretty prominent Hollywood guys there, and George Lucas, who's obviously a big donor at SC and a big supporter, you know, we were talking about this very subject, about how technology is changing the world of film and television. George Lucas said, it's still about the story. It's still about storytelling. No matter what it is, whether it's a 15 second clip or a 12 hour series, it's who are the people, what is it about, how does this affect you? And so I'll leave you with one statement about that. When people talk about what is happening in the world and how all, it's all about technology and it's all about how you receive it, and I'm not saying that's not important, but we have a saying at CBS which is, wireless is useless if you're hitless. So the play is the thing, it's about the content. If you have the good content and you figure out how to sell it, you stay in business and you can make a very good living and our stock is up quite a bit because of that. So with that, I will, I will you know, love to answer any and all questions that you may have. And, uh, you know, it's nice being here with all of you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. We have a microphone here. If you can put up your hand, and Alexander will, will get to you for your questions. Good afternoon. Uh, my question is, obviously, you have a wonderful body of work, and your track record speaks for itself. When you come up with ideas for television programming, is it something that you have a gut instinct that you know this is going to work, or is there an actual formula of the kind of shows that you're able to create that becomes such a major success? Thank you, but uh, you know, once again, I don't come up with the ideas for the shows. I'm, I'm more of, a, of an editor and a show picker, so I hear ideas, and, and once again, I have a, a, a wonderful team. You know, I, I have, I have a, a group of people, and fortunately we've been together for a long, long time, who bring me the ideas, and, and it depends on a lot of things. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, I only put on shows that I like, unless there's nothing else available. You know, it, I mean, there's occasion that something has gone in there because you can't say, gee, on 9.30 on Monday we're going dark because we have nothing. That, that wouldn't quite work, so we've, we've had a couple of turkeys there, but I, I must admit, that I genuinely like content, I love television. Um, generally, the things that work for me, I think I have ADD, so that it helps me in the television business, because it's got to hold your attention early and often, it's got to be characters that you relate to, that you feel for, so I don't think there's any formula, there's a lot of work that goes into it. It's who are the writer and producer, because we like to say we see a lot of good pilots, we don't see a lot of good series, so it's about who can keep it up for episode 20 and 40, et cetera. Um, and it's also what fits in our schedule, what goes with what's already there. But at the end of the day, you got to like the show. You have to, at the end of that half hour or hour, you got to say, I can't wait to come back next week. I want to see it again. Um, and, and that's what I go by. in virtual reality uh, lately? Is there finally, after a couple of decades of unfulfilled promises, you know, a, a moment where that uh, is going to take off? I, I think it will. I, I think virtual reality is one of the true, you know, one of, one of the, the, the key phrases today, one of the disruptors of today. In other words, what's shaking up the system? I think virtual reality is spectacular. I really do. I, having seen a number of, of demonstration. It's who can execute it. But I, I truly think it's a phenomenal experience. I think it is gonna, it's going to take some time, but I think it's something that really is going to stick. I think the editor is going to have to know how to do things differently. The director certainly is going to have to know how to do things differently because, as somebody said to me, you can't do close-ups in virtual reality. You'll get lost. You know, it's, it's all sort of long shots out there. So I think it's a, it's a great form of technology, and uh, I think we're all going to be using it a lot more. 
Thanks for coming. Question, why with the great history of CBS News did you never start a cable news network? That's a, that's a very good question, and, and uh, fortunately I, I can answer it that my predecessors were asleep at the wheel, and uh, um, Larry Tisch, and he's a man that I admired and liked very much, and he actually hired me, he had the opportunity to start CNN at the time, and CBS at that point in time was so far ahead of the other news networks. You know, it was the network of Morrow and Cronkite, et cetera, and it was a missed opportunity. And by the time I got there, it was a little bit too late. It was a little bit too late, so we were figuring out how to do it. Uh, at one point a few years ago, we were talking about how we could merge with CNN and do something together with them. That never worked out, so we finally have our opportunity online, but, uh, you know, we, it, it was a blown opportunity. Yes, I have a question about um, is 4K and Ultra HD going to be the next 3D? How, how do you plan on implementing 4K TV if, if you do it. Right. 3D at the end of the day is not really working. You know, there, are, there was a flurry of activity in a lot of films. I mean, there will be the occasional film or there'll be a few a year, but there was one point where everybody thought, and this was about five years ago, that every movie, certainly every animated movie, would be 3D. 4K, yes, increases the experience greatly. I think it's phenomenal, especially with sports. Um, you, you watch a football game or a basketball game on, on an 80-inch screen, and, and, it's, and it's truly phenomenal. I mean, a funny story about that is I, I got an opportunity to address the NFL Owners Association this past year. See, when you pay them a billion dollars in rights fees, they treat you very nicely. Um, anyway, the, the, one of the owners said it half-jokingly, but he said, you know, your television co coverage is hurting attendance. The experience is so good at home with replay and, and you know, the, the quality of the picture. Who wants to get in your car and drive somewhere and uh, be cold when you can sit home and have a better experience? So I think the, the technology, the quality will be there. I don't know if it changes the world. You know, I don't know if it becomes anything different about how we do our shows, though. For the traditional uh, set, I guess, uh, TV news used to carry the prestige and the credibility of the network, regardless of their ratings and other factors. Now, I know in this eight day and age, there's a lot less bureaus, there's a lot less investigative journalism, they're cutting back on that in every, it's not just CBS everywhere. Um, how does CBS plan in the future, at least with their TV and news, to buck that trend, maybe be, uh, bring prestige and credibility back to news on, on TV, which is often just, you know, what's popular and, and, and not so in depth? in-depth or investigative? Yeah, I mean, you bring up a valid point. Our news division barely makes any money. It really is basically break-even. We do consider it semi-pro bono television. Um, we think it's very important. We think without a news division, you're not really a network. Obviously, the cable networks have grown up, and the one that's making the most money is Fox News. And it's taken a very partisan point of view and it's doing extremely well commercially. It's doing better than all the other networks put together. I'd like to think that our news division has restored its prestige. I think our morning show, if you really want news in the morning, you watch CBS This Morning. I think GMA is sort of like Entertainment Tonight. Um, you know, I think we are the serious news player. I think Scott Pelley has become a, a, a terrific anchor at 6.30. Um, it is hard, you're right, the bureaus are smaller um, because you're investing all this money with not a great deal of return. So while I want to do the best news product possible, I still have to give a quarterly earnings report to Wall Street. If my stock doesn't go up, I'm, you know, you're going to be talking to somebody else next time uh, here. So that's part of my job, but it's a good question. You know what? The, the good news for us is we really don't have a horse in the race. Um, personally, and I'll tell you what I think, I think Tom Wheeler, the head of the FCC, was right in, in suggesting some light regulation, you know, keeping the highways open but not. And I think the president went way too far with that, you know, with that idea. For us, it doesn't really matter 
you know, where, where you know, our content will always have a place on, on the web. So it's, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be the smaller guys that are fighting their way on, on the highway. And you know what? There is a difference between what we do and what YouTube does. There is a difference, and, and so it, it's something that we're obviously watching with great interest, but we're sort of, we have enough battles out there, we're staying out of that one. Thank you for coming. Uh, I have a question about advertisement. How this new trend and everything you're doing online and this new platform will affect your media buy on your traditional uh, network that you actually broadcast? And what, what are the numbers lately? Did you see big change and that's why you went and kind of compensated for that? Yeah, there, there, there definitely is a trend, and, you know, and, and you read a lot about it lately. Gee, all the money is moving online. It's all moving to digital advertising. There's no question the digital space is growing in advertising a great deal. Our answer to that is, you know, a lot of it's coming out of print. The last I could tell, there aren't too many newspapers making a lot of money. They're losing their advertising to online. And it sort of makes sense that that is a better replacement for the newspaper. The other thing I think it does, I think it takes away from the smaller cable networks. In other words, the very, very targeted audience. What I like to say about CBS is we're the broad tent. You're welcome if you're 10 years old or if you're 80 years old. Come on in. And advertisers can't live without that. You know, 20 million people watch NCIS every Tuesday night. It takes a lot of hits on YouTube to hit 20 million. You know, so we're still secure, but, you know, the, the murmuring about it all moving to digital makes people nervous. Thank you very much for the great speech, sir. Uh, I'd love to watch 60 Minutes, but you know what I have to say, sir? Could you possibly tell me how can I avoid having to pay for the Kardashians when I never watch it in when I buy my cable? Yeah. It just irks me. Sure. Well, <laughs> well, fortunately, we don't have the Kardashians on our network. So, um, no, you, you bring up a very interesting problem, question, which is these large cable operators, the Comcast, the DirecTVs, they sell you what's called the bundle, which means the average home in America gets 150 channels of which they're watching 12 to 15 of them regularly. So you're paying for a lot of garbage that you would never watch, you know? This has been a system that's been developed over time where the bigger cable guys would say, okay, you like ESPN? Give me six more ESPNs. Let's expand that universe. And when we get paid by the cable operators and we ask for a lot of money because we say we have more viewers and we have quality viewers, and they say, well, gee, we don't want to pass that on to the customer. I said, you're right. You should cancel the channel that has the Kardashian, so you're not paying 20 cents a month for that channel. So will it evolve to that? Probably. A lot of the companies don't like it, but for CBS, we have Showtime and CBS, so we like that idea. He said all these debates between the content providers and the distributors are these massive public relations warfare operations where somebody blinks first. Um, tell us a little bit about DISH, if you would, and the negotiation. Okay. But the bigger point here, is content too expensive, particularly sports? Okay. Is it F worth it? Fair enough. Um, number one, DISH, we're, we're in the middle of one of those heated battles right now. I can't talk too much about it. Uh, we were supposed to go dark tomorrow night. I think we've delayed that for a few days. Um, so hopefully they come to their senses and pay us what we deserve. Um, you know, the Mike White, you know, very smart man, and he has a valid point and a point that we like to make as well. We, as I said, the average home only gets 12, to, watches 12 to 15 channels. They should only pay for those channels. 
This is sort of sacrilegious in the content world where the Walt Disney Company has 30 cable channels and Fox has a lot of them. We don't have a lot of that, you know? So when Mike says they're paying too much for content, um, he means the content that people aren't watching. I don't think Mike White minds paying CBS what we are getting per sub. I think he minds paying a quarter for the Kardashians and, you know, 12 versions of it. Look, sports rights have gotten very out of hand. Um, I remember when the Guggenheim guys, and we were all there, bought the Dodgers for what we thought was a ridiculous amount of money, $2.2 billion, Guggenheim. How could they afford that? Then Time Warner comes and gives them $8 billion for the TV rights, which I don't think was a very smart deal. So Time Warner Cable then tries to pass that on to the other cable operators who say, we're not gonna pay that much. We don't wanna pay that much. So unfortunately, only 30% of the homes in Los Angeles got to see the Dodgers. This, you know, which was sort of tragic since they had a great season until the playoffs. Um, <laughs> um, you know, but, but so, so Mike is not saying anything dissimilar to us. We always say, pay for the eyeballs. Pay for us, don't pay for the smaller cable channels. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions on your international market strategy. Um, first, uh, is uh, your challenges in international markets mostly around expanding distribution, other than piracy, of course, and those types of things? And the second, are there any opportunities in internationally oriented content, uh, either in co-production or anything like that, to expand uh, international? Uh, an, an interesting thing happened, you know, yes, our, our, our main goal is to expand our distribution to more territories, newer territories that haven't been affected, and also, obviously, as our shows become more and more successful, to raise the prices on them. Um, the, the second question was about, I'm sorry, oh, oh the, the international content. A funny thing happened about 15 years ago. So, America... In, in, you know, in, in our, a little bit of our arrogance, only exported our product. We only exported. We, we sold it all over the world, and by the way, we are the best at that. We're the best at doing that. And for a while, there were quota systems in France, which limited the number of shows we could sell. And then eventually, they came to their senses and removed that, and we sold a lot of that content. Then what happened was we began to import, and it started with reality television. So Survivor and Big Brother, which are two of our biggest reality hits, were both imports from Europe. They were both successful in Europe before they came here. Dancing with the Stars, The Voice, all started overseas and came to America. Then it started expanding. Homeland, our homeland, is an Israeli show was based on an Israeli, a successful Israeli series, and we took that premise and, and our guys created Homeland. So we are, there is a lot more co-production going on. There are a lot more American companies that have partnerships there. We have partnerships with a lot of companies throughout the world in terms of channels, um, you know, which is an expanding business as well. So there is a lot more outreach on the part of the American companies. And uh, so it, it's a much more international business than it's ever been. Time for just two more questions, so there, and then gentlemen at the back. Okay, um, <clears throat> thank you for coming. I have a little different question. I'm wondering how CBS's corporate philanthropy and civic engagement, how does that reflect your values or, and perhaps in, enhance the CBS brand? CBS, you know, we, we, we have a big advantage, and obviously we, we are able to contribute to a lot of causes that we think are worthwhile and things that make sense to us. Um, I am not the sole decision maker and we're very careful about it. what we have the advantage, as do the other networks, is something called PSAs, public service announcements, which are worth hundreds of millions of dollars a year where we can present messages that really affect people a lot more than just writing out a check. It's not to say that we don't write out our fair share of checks. Um, you know, there are a number of things that are extremely important to us, and. Uh, you know, we, we contribute to them, and they're sort of across the board. We, every other year, we donate an hour to stand up to cancer. Once again, that's virtually a $5 million donation. 
We do a lot for ecology. So they're, they're, it's pretty wide ranging, our philanthropy, and it's pretty important to us. So that's the final question. Um, I, I'm a teacher at a, a Bachelor's School of Global Leadership. We talk about diversity in our school. And your other, other uh, competitors, they have TV shows that address uh, diversity. Um, how do you address diversity in your network? Because I don't see a lot of diversity coming from the shows that are on CBS. Well, I, I, would, I would beg to differ with you. ABC, obviously, this year has a, lot, a few more African-American shows, and they've done a very good job with that. Diversity is very, very important to us, but it's not only just the entertainment shows, it's our news shows and uh, what we present to people. And if you look at virtually every drama ensemble, there are people of color in them, and in, in every instance of casting, that's one of the first things we think about. Are there more diverse people that we can get? Once again, as I said before, unless we're watched by many millions of people every night, we're not doing a good job and we're not doing the appropriate outreach. So it, it is a priority for us. Um, we're probably not doing as well as ABC is in prime time, but I'd say in news and sports, we're doing better than they are. So it, it, it does even out, but we will continue to, do, uh, continue to try to do more. Thank you Good. very much. Thank you, Charlie.